Welcome to everyone. Welcome to this great event. And I feel honored to be invited to speak to you. Today I would like to share some thoughts on the contemporary challenges which current modern banking is facing at the moment. But before this I would like to introduce myself. So I'm Beata Lubinska. I lead small boutique consulting company in London. I have 16 years of practical experience in banking <coughs> based in Milan, in London, through a number of financial institutions such as G Capital, Deloitte, Standard Charter Bank, Midirect Banking Group, in the space of asset liability management, treasury, and risk management. And I was honored to deliver the PhD program through at Wrocław University of Economics. It was mainly based and referred to the asset liability management, so my favorite topic, my specialization. And I would like to share with you what is going on in London, in Milan, and also in Poland, because all the world is linked together, there is interconnection between different spaces. So first of all, we will be talking about some small, several words on the philosophy of banking, uh, from where it has begun. Then, what is the business model, conventional business model of banking? And what is the intermediary role of banks currently? Then I would like to tackle a bit the concept of maturity transformation and how the introduction of the new regulatory requirements, in particular the Basel free liquidity requirements, has impacted this main source of income for banks. Then we'll be talking about heavy regulatory landscape because it's changing and it has changed. Now regulators are asking more and more is restrictive activity of banks. So we have quite significant impact on banks coming from the regulatory, heavy regulatory landscape. Then I will talk about the margin compression, important concept in the banking industry right now. Why right now? Because we have negative rates in Europe, not in Poland, in Eurozone, and banks are struggling. We have also low interest rates in other economies, like UK, US even, since uh, several years ago. And in Japan, still negative. So there is very um, drag on the, it is drag on the income and PNL of banks, and I will show you why. So there is the new concept emerging in the banking industry, especially through um, practitioners, which consists in the integration in the model, in the models, risk management model, in the strategic asset liability management. So it will be no more silo basis based management <coughs> of banks. Now it is all about collaboration between different business units and also within the ILM itself. The ILM, as you know, or Treasury Asset Liability Management is the heart of the bank today. So this is why I am uh, emphasizing this concept so much. And then finally, we will ask ourselves, what will be the future of banking? So how the banks in 2030, for example, could look like. First of all, we know that uh, banks are not, um, not young institutions. They are very old institutions. The first rudimentary banks existed since 2000 years before Christ, and it was in India. Um, after we had in the Roman Empire a bit more sophisticated banks involved in the trading uh, of grains and exchange of money between lenders and depositors. <coughs> And it was not very complex, rudimentary, but it is considered the prime, the first banking in, in the world. Then we have the, uh, in Northern Europe especially, we have the real banks like we see it today. And it was in 14th, 15th century. And the oldest bank in the world still exists. You know what is his name? Who knows what is the oldest banks in the world, which still exist until now? It's Monte Paschi di Siena. It is the Italian bank with the headquarters in Siena, 
which has been set up in 1472 and it is still existing, even though it has many problems with capitalization, with margin compression, so the negative PL on the uh, on the income of this bank. But still, even if struggle, because every bank, and especially Italian banks, are struggling right now, but it survived, it has survived or since 1472. So the first mission of the bank is to stay alive. I don't know any bank which says, uh, my statement mission is to stay for 10 years. No. So the equity shareholders want to stay, to act, to operate in perpetuity. So they want to be alive. But in order to be alive, you have to have a robust balance sheet. Because for banking and for banks, balance sheet is everything. If it is well governed, it is, if it is uh, uh, well managed from the risk management perspective, if the business model of the banks is right, then you have some degree of success and you have chance to succeed in the market and to survive currently. Why survive? Because there is so much competition right now. So not only regulatory changes, the regulatory requirements are heavy. Not only um, low environments, which is hitting the PLL of banks, but there is also the competition. There are challenger banks. I don't know if you heard about the challenger banks. So the banks, especially in UK, which are rising now since several years ago, they are paying to depositors 1-2% of interest on deposits, and they are competing with the big banks, which are struggling to survive. And the guardians of the balance sheet is obviously the board of directors. But on the daily basis, there are two, three main participants. It is the finance, it is triumvirate, so the three people in power, which on the daily basis managing the balance sheet of the bank. And it, they have to do it well, otherwise the bank will fail. So we have the finance department, treasury, and risk. And what's the most important, that they have to collaborate together. There is no more working on the silo-based approach. Now, especially in London and in Europe, it is the concept which is going to die. They understood that in order to survive, they need each other. They need to collaborate. So first of all, let's abide the concept of uh, silo basis approach. What is the business conventional business model of bank, of any bank in the world? For sure, we have several things. We have the leverage. It is based on <coughs> leverage because a small capital base is levered up into an asset pool which is 10, 20, or 30 times greater. Now, again, the regulator has come to limit this number and is saying no more leverage ratio than 30 times greater. There is maturity transformation. What is maturity transformation? Is the most probably important concept in banking, especially in the treasury and in the asset liability management space. Why? Because even though 60% of the net interest income for the bank is gained from credit differential, so the difference between on the asset side and liability side, the difference what is paid by the lender to the bank and what is paid by the bank to depositor, there is obviously clear difference which forms the net interest margin of the bank. But 20% is still based on the maturity transformation. And maturity transformation is very, it is very easy concept. It is because banks are transforming the short-term repricing or the short-term maturity funding into medium-long-term repricing or maturing asset. So we can quite often hear that banks lend long and borrow short. It means that they are borrowing from depositors at the shorter term that they are lending in the, into the market, into the clients on the asset side. And this makes 
it, it will positively impact on the on the PL of the bank. Why? Because usually we assume that the slope of the interest rate curve, the term structure of interest rate, is positive. So if the tenor is longer, then there is higher rate. So they will receive the higher rate from the client and they will pay the lower rate to deposits. And there is this difference. I will show you later in detail. Then liquidity. So there is assumption that one or the bank will always be able to roll over funds because they have to be strong assumption that I will be able to roll over my funding to the father for the father maturity and I will be able to roll it over at the good cost of funds, so the rational cost of funds. So I will be not overpaying because of some adverse situation in the market. This is known as a funding risk. And this funding risk is the fundamental, again, for the asset liability management. Risk management. So there is obviously some customer side, and the banks are lending money, but they don't want to lend to anyone. They need to be sure that those persons to who they are lending money are of good credit quality. So they will not default. And this is this mitigation of the credit risk, which is the main driver for the credit risk management. And it was, since several years ago, the most important risk in the bank. And it still it is the main risk in the bank. But there's also some additional uh, financial risk coming and catching up with the credit risk. There is interest rate risk in the banking book. There is liquidity risk. There is counterpart risk and many more operational risk, which is getting more important because of the digi digital transformation, uh, technology, we'll be talking about it later in detail. And finally, we have regulatory compliance. So the banks are heavily um, regulated and scrutinized by the central bank and by, by the um, regulatory authorities, such as European Central Bank and EBA in Europe, so European Banking Authority, PRA, Prudential Regulatory Authority in UK, and many more over the whole globe. So they are providing banks with the strict standards and the banks have to abide to them, them which is very costly for banks. And this is also the reason why banks are currently struggling so much. So this intermediation, the, the basic role, the basic concept of bank, why they are existing, for what? Because they obviously are inter, intermediates between the customers and on the asset side and the customers on the liability side. So they provide the, uh, the funds to lenders and they gather funds from depositors and that's it. But they are not the charity institutions. So they are not doing it for free. They need to earn money. This is a business. This is the normal business like any other industry, but with the important, significant impact in our society. And for this reason, because of this importance, because of the systematic risk which can arise when the bank fail or when they are struggling, there is so heavy regulation. So this intermediate role, intermediation role, uh, of the bank is of the crucial importance for every single economy in the world. This is why banks exist. Maturity transformation, even though this chart looks quite complex, but it's not. It is nothing else like providing funds to the, to the asset side, which are longer term. You can see it uh, on the right side. We have here invested into mortgage with the duration a higher duration, let's say three years duration, and founded by current accounts, by people who are current account deposits in the banks, and they can withdraw them at demand, on demand. So they are side deposits. And the contractual maturity is very short. And what the bank pays you for those funds? Almost nothing. And what they get from the, uh, from the lenders on mortgage depends now, the rates are different in different countries, but at least 3%, 2.5%. And this is this differential between the rate on the asset and the rate on liabilities. And for the ILM, it's the crucial.
shell concept because they are running maturity transformation or rate transformation and gain in this way money. This is one of the fundamental ways of doing money in the bank. You can see it here, I, I underline this concept because it's so important. I underline it in the, uh, on the top you have the flow approach. So you have the asset, the flow of the asset in maturity, which is funded by the shorter expiring of the pricing liability. It is not the same, repricing and expiring, but this is not the lecture on ILM. So I'm going to show you just the concept. So you can see that liability in repayment needs to be rolled over. Rolled over needs to be, again, refinanced. And in order to refinance it at the good price, the bank has to have good quality credit standards, so the credit rating had to have to be well perceived in the market, and it has to find those who borrow the money to the bank. And this is on the lower side, you can see uh, at the bottom, you can see the outstanding, the same picture from the outstanding perspective. So you have the asset with liquidity commitment already locked in, which is funded by the shorter repricing or shorter expiration of liability. And you have the gap. You have the gap which exposes the bank to the risk. And this is the concept of risk management, financial risk management in this particular case. It is risk, funding risk, because the bank cannot be sure at which price or at which funding spread they will refund those liabilities. And this is the, the important thing that now regulator has put a drag on this maturity transformation. Given that in the past, since the Basel III Basel Committee on Banking Supervision and on liquidity especially has come into effect. The bank, especially Italian banks, were doing a lot of maturity transformation in order to gain more money. Not only maturity transformation, they were using also other strategies to, to, which are acting as a profitability enhancement, like for example structural hedging. But then the regulator has come to the picture and said, no, now you will be doing it with my rules. You will be subject to net stable funding ratio on the middle part uh, for the middle uh, long uh, funding. And they need the, some portion of the stable funding in the bank in order to fund medium long term asset. So there is no more possibility to do so much maturity transformation. It has to be, there has to be equilibrium between the volatile funding and the medium long or stable funding. And this is the main concept behind net stable funding ratio. So regulator uh, limited this extent of maturity transformation. And let's have a look at regulator itself. So quite recently, we faced the new uh, standards on uh, interest rate risk. It was in 2018. They has come up with the regulatory required. These are not required. Basel are not regulatory. It is not a law. law. It is only the best practice. So the Basel Committee on the Banking Supervisions always provide banks with the best practice related to different subjects. This is one of the examples, which is very close to my heart, which is interest rate risk in the banking book. And these are the standards related to the management of this important risk category in the bank. So they said, you need to measure it, you need to mitigate it, you need to document it. There has to be some model validation. The model, any model in the bank has to be validated by the third party. So how burden, much burden it is for the bank? Because they have to find, assume, to employ new people to do this. They have to probably outsource the model validation to the model validator. And there's a lot of things to do. Then you have the EBA with many rules related to the credit risk, counterparty risk, uh, to the TILAC, for sure you have heard about the TILAC, the total loss absorbing capacity for the banks. 
the resolution uh, planning, contingency funding planning. And now we have seen also the regulation, regulator is requiring the, the standardized approach for the counterparty risk. And many more is going to come. For example, the credit spread risk in the banking book. So every single aspect of banking is heavily regulated. And this is something which the banks spent from my personal experience uh, in my last uh, place, uh, Mid Direct Bank, uh, we spent almost 80% of time working on the compliance with the regulator. And where is the creativity? Where is something where the, the bank is, needs more um, initiatives in order to increase the profitability? We didn't have time to this because regulator is asking for the stress testing. Once a year we have the stress testing exercise for every single bank which is important in the European Union. So they are subject to the stress testing. Uh, in 2017, we had the stress test on interest rate risk. Uh, in 2018, it was wide market stress test for all banks. In 2019, it was liquidity stress testing. And every single bank spent almost several months of repayment to this stress testing. So it is important, this highly regulated landscape is going to squeeze the profitability of, of banks because from one side, squeeze the profitability, from other side, it is good that we have the regulatory requirements so, so important that they are looking because the depositors' money are involved there, right? No one wants to lose their money because of the mismanagement or misconduct of the bank. Margin compression. This is something which is uh, linked to the negative or low interest rates environment in which we are living right now, decade since financial crisis of low or negative interest rates, which impact the bank, destroy the bank day by day. Why? Imagine this is the real picture taken from Standard Charter Bank uh, over the years after the financial crisis. And this uh, green arrow is showing you the squeeze on the debt <coughs> interest margin which the banks was gaining over this year. So why? Because the asset base were mainly floating rate assets. So they were indexed to the rate which was floating with the movements of the rate in the market. And it was funded by the core of stable funding, which is current accounts. We cannot uh, charge down current accounts, right? We cannot charge uh, them negative rates because we lose the depositors. For this reason, the rate on the liability size, uh, side was the same, but the rate on the asset side was going down, was reduced. And in this case, you can see that the margin has been squeezed because earnings were reinvested uh, so that the uh, I mean, CASA, CASA is current account, savings accounts, you call it quite often core current accounts or quite often NIP canon, interest bearing current accounts. The end equity, they are reinvested at the lower rates because the rates are going lower and lower. So this is the typical example of margin compression. So the banks understood that in order to, uh, to survive, and to abide these problems of the regulatory requirement, negative rates, uh, competition in the market, uh, emergence of the challenger banks in the industry, they had to do something. So they were starting to think about the um, mitigation of the transition from the static on traditional approach in management, and especially here I'm referring to that. Uh, asset liability management, strategic balance sheet management, uh, the concept which has been coined quite listen, uh, recently in London. Uh, so from, tra uh, uh, from a traditional approach to balance sheet management to this strategic approach. And the traditional approach is mainly based on the reactive process in the management. What does it mean? Imagine that you have those three participants in the banking activity. There is the asset side, liability side, and in the, mid mid in the middle you have the treasury or LM, so this engine or heart of the banking, uh, the banking activity. 
and there is no collaboration between them. So the asset side is doing the budgets, they are uh, extending loans to the client, and there is only the head of the asset center who decides what's the, according to the policy, commercial policy of the bank, who decides which kind of loans they are going to take on the balance sheet. There is the liability, head of liability center, who is uh, managing the de deposits, and he decides, do we need 20% of time depot, at what price, what is the best strategy, our funding plan for the next five years or three years, and there is no collaboration between them. They don't speak to each other. They don't agree the strategy, funding strategy between themselves, because why asset, has to, asset center has to communicate with the funding center. But then in the meantime, we have the ILM who manage all risk inherited from asset and liability side, and it is a re reactive, not proactive approach, the silo basis approach. So they manage, they mitigate. But where is the proactivity? Where is the enhancement profitability stra uh, strategy in, in this? There is none. So this new term of strategic approach to balance sheet management is meant to, to communicate, to make the communication between asset side, liability side, and ILM. And even within the ILM itself, the person who is responsible for funding of the bank needs to speak to the person who is responsible for the interest rate risk management in the bank, and the person who is also meant to manage the tactical liquidity, so very short liquidity for funding intraday activity in the bank, they have to be on the same page. They have to collaborate. No more silent approach. And you can't imagine how much is still this um, silo basis approach um, in, the, in the DNA of the current banking. And it is strong. So the banks has, for, has been thinking what should be done in order to integrate it all together. Then are there any benefits if we integrate the asset side, liability side, and ILM within itself? And it looks like that there is. And there are two, at least, tools known right now which the banks are using for strategic management of the banking book. One is the strategic funds transfer pricing. It is the integrated model between the asset, liability and ILM, where the ILM acts like a bank within a bank. So it provides the funding to the asset center. The asset are paying the FTP price, funds transfer price to the, uh, to the ILM. And the ILM is taking the funds from the deposit center as remunerating the deposit center the FTP rate. And then, the, in this way, look what is happening in this way. The asset and liability center are immune to any financial risk. And the center, so the ILM unit, inherits all financial risk exposure, which will be managed with the policy, risk policy, ILM policy, and bank's policy. And they will be remunerating the positive spread, which you can see here, 0.99%, only because they are in intermediation, there is this intermediation role between assets and liabilities. This is known as strategic fund transfer pricing. And in particular, the practitioners use the name of maturity matched fund transfer pricing which uh, many books are written right now, uh, has been written on this topic, and uh, banks are quite uh, heavily involved in the implementation of this concept and how to improve it further. Be because for FTP and right FTP curve, you can steer the banking book. You will be steering, you will be in encouraging the production of the such kind of asset and liabilities that they are good for the bank. And you will remove, you will read, get rid of the products which are not benefiting the bank, which will be destroying the value of the bank. And this is what this process is meant to provide to the bank, additional add value. So through this strategic FTP, you will recognize which product is beneficial for the bank and which, are, which one is not. Before the strategic FTP, 
There was only FTP tool used as a, a tool which let you know which product has which profitability, but not for steering of banking book. This is the new trend which is emerging in the market. This is emerging in the banking right now. The banks are steering. How many conferences you can see at Marcus Evans and RiskNet, which are talking about steering the banking with the balance sheet through FTP? Even I wrote one article on this. So this is the process when you can encourage the, some, the good quality product which you want to have within your banking book through this process. The second one, uh, maybe um, I want to show you, this is very close to my heart, is the balance sheet optimization. So what to do in order to optimize banking book. For sure you have heard about the optimization of banking book, optimization in the banks, optimization of the capital base, but what does it mean? Is it the, only the buzzword? No, optimization is the concrete concept which can be implemented within the banks, which is being implemented right now. So you will be using the heavy mathematics concept, mathematical concept, such as numerical optimization, and you will be implementing it in the banking book on the daily basis, in the treasury for sure. What does it mean? This is the, and not only in art, the heavy science is involved in banking right now. We are using differential equations. We are using the Lagrange multipliers. We are using very many heavy math physicians who are working at the banks in order to, um, uh, in order to implement this uh, optimization. And this is the process, which I don't want to enter into detail, but at least it helps. You, you can see that you are optimizing through different uh, dimensions. So uh, you have the liquidity risk with the interest rate risk, economic capital, regulatory capital, and you are looking at the stress testing from the another dimension, and you are all optimizing into one picture in order to answer the question, what should be my banking book looking like in order me, bank, to gain money, to have additional profitability? How it should look like? in order to enhance the profitability of the bank. And you are looking at this picture, you are answering this question, looking at different dimensions. So risk perspective, profitability perspective, regulatory requirements, and the commercial policy, policy of the bank as well, because there is also this to, take, to be taken into account. And then, this is one of the results of my PhD dissertation, how the optimization uh, model can help the banks. So you can, for example, reduce cost of funds. If you integrate the liquidity dimension plus the interest rate risk dimension plus capital dimension all together and you go with the op numerical optimization into the model, mathematical model, you form this mathematical model, you can have the benefits in quite big benefits in terms of the funding structure. And now the ILM uh, system providers like uh, SunGuard, for sure you have heard, QRM, like Prometea, so Airmas, they are building those models into ILM systems. It is known like mini treasure, pocket treasure. So it will tell the banks what should be the structure, the optimal structure of your banking book in order to be more competitive, more profitable, and still compliant with the regulatory requirements. The last thing, uh, but not the, uh, the latest, is the modern risk. Now, every single bank has some degree of the model risk involved in the activity, daily activity. For example, the modeling of current accounts. Current accounts that do not have the behavior, the contractual maturity once you are dealing with them within the treasury. They have the behavioral maturity. A behavioral maturity, it means that you have to behaviorize them from the perspective to predict the behavior of the client. You have to apply some models, and there are different models, regressions, heavy regressions, so kernel regressions, there are different models in order to come up with this modeling of non maturity items, like credit overdrafts, or on the liability side, uh, CASA, so current accounts, savings accounts, and to come up 
with the characteristics of those products in order to calculate your accurate interest rate risk exposure, liquidity risk, and all other things. So there is the model risk, which is for the first time underlined by the regulator. Regulator for the first time is asking to have the um, capital adequacy if you have over-complicated models, over-engineered models in your bank, you will be paying some surcharge in terms of the capital adequacy. So the regulator can ask you, your model I don't understand, it is quite complicated, it is not well explained, you are too much reliant on the modeling assumptions, you will be paying additional capital, capital in terms of the pillar two. So it is important. And even more, the interest rate risk regulatory requirements are asking to have the model validation for all models related to IRBB, which, is, which never happened in the past. So they are more standardized. There is the standardization through the risk management in all banks. And what will be the bank in, the, in 2030? It's quite easy to predict. Given that we have this cyber risk and financial crimes and frauds, the banks need to focus much more on the security, from the, uh, to embrace advanced technology and artificial intelligence. So this is the future for banking, artificial intelligence, uh, in order to improve the visibility, threat visibility, and to detect the fraud in advance and to make sure that they will be uh, security for the clients, they will be security for the, uh, uh, for, for the money of these depositors. And the second point is data. You cannot have the right model, you cannot have the good prediction, good simulation of your net interest income or your risk exposure for the next five years or three years if you don't have data. The data have to be accurate and have to be integrated and from one only platform. And there's again a regulator who is saying that you need to have the accurate data in order to calculate your risk exposure. So the data is power. Without good data, you don't come anywhere. And then digital and new technologies, digital transformation, uh, maybe for now it is only a buzzword of today, but for the banks in the future it will be imperative in order to succeed. So it will be more technology, more um, artificial intelligence heavily involved in the banking operations. And I see many for you, for you uh, in the future for the banks and uh, your, from your help, your experience for sure there is uh, there is big possibility, the opportunity for someone like you to improve the, uh, the banking landscape and to help the banks in the future journey. Thank you very much.